Yosef, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks so much for being here. I've been really looking forward to this. As we were discussing, as we joined this call, we realized that we actually overlapped a month ago at uh, InfoBiff Shift, and somehow uh, we were both speakers there, and we, we somehow missed each other. Uh, so we'll have to wait until next year to meet in person. But yeah, I'm excited to to meet you today and to kind of uh, dive into your background of uh, you know multiple years building the, this company from the technology side. Yeah, I mean, like, I, I cannot believe that we managed to miss each other. But again, there's so many people there speaking. It actually isn't such a surprise. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, Sophoscore is a really interesting um, project. And I really love talking about uh, what we did and how we got to this place and like what problems we have uh, and how we solve them. And I always kind of see it as a way to kind of give back to to other people um, to kind of uh, see what mistakes we had mm -hmm. and maybe not do them. And, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, for myself, like uh, a big part of the way that I learn, you know, new technologies, new concepts is by listening to uh, in-depth interviews with people who have, have sort of been there, done that. And it's a great way to learn, uh, you know, what mistakes people have made, but also how they've evolved their way of thinking and how different technologies that they've adopted sort of unlocked or solved various problems for them or made it easier. Maybe they started with sort of, uh, you know, DIY and then they figured out, oh, well, like I, I don't need to build this. I can actually, you know, use this open source project or I can, you know, buy this, you know, SaaS product or something like that to kind of alleviate some of that pain. But so we'll get through, we're going to dive into all that stuff, but maybe before we go too deep, can you give a little bit of background about who you are and what do you do? Sure. So currently I have the role of CTO at Sophoscore, which I've had for 11 years now. Um, I've been with the company for 13 years. Um, I started with uh, just a regular software developer and kind of moved my way up. Um, I've been with computers for as long as I can remember, basically, so since elementary school, um, that's 25 years now. Um, I, I've kind of always been fascinated with, with them, um, with the ability that you can just tell the computer what it will do, and then it will do it exactly that. And if something doesn't work, then it's on you, uh, not on the computer. Um, I also love, love optimizing everything. Um, it's really a... a <laughs> maybe even to the point of disease. Uh, I cannot help myself if I see that something is suboptimal uh, and I've tried to like make everything work faster and for uh, cheaper uh, and for everything to be better. I also love tinkering with different technologies. Um, so yeah, that's about me. Yeah, there's a certain like personal satisfaction that you can get from sort of like you're really getting the weeds of like bit twiddling things for like optimization and taking something that, you know, maybe you can make a, you know, 10 X or hundred X improvement on, on the performance of it just by making certain tweaks or, or, or making sort of different, um, you know, data structure changes or strategy changes or algorithm changes. And it can have a major impact essentially on, uh, what you can do from a product standpoint. Can you, so you've been at SofaScore for 13 years and, Probably not necessarily everyone is super familiar with with the company. Uh, I know you're you're based out of Croatia, but can you give a little bit of background about what is Sofascore? You know, when did it start, and you know, what is sort of the scale of the company today in terms of uh, you know users, traffic, requests, and so forth? To so just kind of uh, set some context and shape the picture of where you are. Yeah, sure. So the company was started in 2010, 13 years ago. Um, and it basically happened um, slowly. So the founders, they, they were having an online forum and they realized that uh, the best uh, topics that people go for are related to sports. So they started writing their own topics on that forum and it, they gained a lot of traction. Uh, they had good SEO. Mm -hmm. And then they realized that they could reinvest the money into actually building an app that will do the things that they were doing uh, automatically. So that's when I came in, I came in um, myself and one other guy. Um, and basically what SofaScore is uh, now and uh, uh, how we started is it's basically a live scoring app. So you can 
uh, watch your favorite teams or sports or players in real time. Um, you can see their performance. You can also see a lot of stats, especially for football. So basically, it's like a second screen when you are watching a game. Uh -huh. Or if you cannot watch a game, you can always look and see what's what's happening. We really do have a lot of different statistics. Uh, we have heat maps for players. Uh, we have over 250 statistics for each player for each match that has a good coverage. Um, and the users recognize that. So we are currently at um, 25 million monthly active users and they generate more than 1.3 petabytes of traffic each month, which is uh, which translates to more than 300 billion requests that the servers have to handle. So it's it's a lot. And I mean, the, the thing is also that the way the app works is we have the most users when there's a lot of games. So we get really big spikes. Mm -hmm. And our uh, our peak was 1.8 million people uh, real time, uh, which which was which was a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I want to go back, sort of, to so that's kind of the current state. I want to go back to like you know sort of the beginning and just kind of shape the picture of where you started from an engineering standpoint. So back in the early days of being an engineer so sort of, can you just kind of describe what that experience was like how big was the team and what was the the infrastructure like back then i'm sure it's significantly simplistic in comparison to where it is today oh yeah it was a totally different time so it was just uh, two guys me and one other guy we were doing the back end and front end um and it was it was it was horrible i'm gonna be honest uh because we were students at a time so there were weeks where when we didn't do anything because there we were um, studying um, and then when we did we were basically kids so uh, didn't really want to code when we didn't feel like it uh, but if we put that aside the issue the main issue was we didn't really know how to scale the infrastructure so mm -hmm. None of us had any experience of how you should deal with, with uh, spiking traffic. And the nature of the app, uh, and it was a website at the time, is that you get a lot of users in a very short amount of time, and then um, the rest of the time you don't actually get any traffic. So the way we did it, it was uh, we started writing in PHP, um, and it was with a MySQL database, and it was all on one server. And then when people came, uh, it couldn't handle the load because it was just one machine. And then everything crashed. And then you just kind of hope that uh, people will go away and those most persistent ones will actually get to see the results, which, you know, it's not a way to handle business. Uh, it's a bad business practice, as you, as you might imagine. Um, and then we started to kind of see how can we uh, survive those spikes and what can we do uh, to the infrastructure to kind of uh, handle more. And the first thing you do is you split the web from the database, mm -hmm. which is what we did. Uh, then we were able to handle a bit more. But still, you know, when, when more people came, the site would just crash. And it didn't happen often, but we didn't really have a solution at, the time, at that time. Um, and then we kind of started to, to look around, what can we do to uh, kind of survive those spikes? And the first thing you do is you add cache. So we did, we added memcache, it helped, but uh, like PHP is slow. So when you boot PHP, you still have to boot the PHP to fetch the data from memcache and return it. And then it would also, we could handle more, but at a certain point it, it would also crash. Um, and the thing is, we didn't manage the infra ourselves. Uh, we actually had a company that was doing that for us. Um, and the, the problem is they didn't know how to scale either. So they would install PHP via VHM and cPanel, which is not something you do. Um, mm -hmm. So at that point, I was like, uh, I talked to the founders and I said, listen, this is the prime use case for cloud. So this was 2013. And the cloud was something really new. Uh, not a lot of people were using it. Uh, and I said, this is the ideal case. So most of the time you have very low traffic. And then when spikes happen, you can auto scale. And then when 
the people go away, you can just scale down. Um, they asked me, do I know how to do it? I said, sure, we're going to do it. I did not know how to do it. I, I had no experience whatsoever. I was really into tech, so I knew I'm going to try my best. I'm going to see what I can do, kind of read everything I can on the internet. But honestly, I had no idea how that actually would turn out. Uh, but it did turn out uh, great. So we were on the cloud for a couple of years and it worked really, really well. That's when we actually kind of uh, decided to uh, look into the caching layer to figure that out. And from that point on, our caching layer is really a, a robust and complex piece of work. Uh, it can ha that's what enables us to really scale to this level where we are now. Mm -hmm. And the original investment in cloud, was that with AWS? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if there were any other clouds at that point. Yeah, you know, probably, the yeah. AWS were just the clouds mm -hmm. you would you would use. But yeah, AWS. Yeah, and even AWS, you know, ten years ago was you know a much different world than it is today. Yeah. Like you probably had S three, EC two virtual instances. Yeah. I don't even know and if that's, like that's Elastic Beanstalk it. existed <laughs> at that point. I, I, no, I don't think it did. Like mm -hmm. you had root fifty three, mm -hmm. you had S three, and you had EC two. And I think that's it. Yeah. I don't think there are any other services at, at that point in time. But you know, it was enough. You could do a lot with it. We had an auto scaling group, and then when uh, traffic spikes came, it would just auto scale magically. It would work. Um, it was amazing. Um, I mean, that that's what enabled us to grow at that point in time because we didn't have to plan. I mean, we couldn't plan our growth. We didn't know how many users will come. We didn't know how. Uh, how our growth would look like. So cloud really enabled us to kind of focus on the product and to build that uh, and not really think about infrastructure that mm -hmm. much. And then how were you running your databases back then? Were they running directly on EC2 instances or were you, I, I, I'm assuming this was even, you know, pre our services like RDS. So were you, did you have to manage your own sort of uh, yeah, like so, database cluster? Yeah. So, um, I think uh, we did it ourselves in in the first days, but then uh, we moved to RDS. RDS was really amazing; mm -hmm. that worked really well. And then, you know, um, as project grew, we kind of started changing uh, some components that we had. Uh, we've switched from one data provider. So basically, the way we get our data is we buy it from a data provider. And we, when we were switching from one data provider to another. Um, the other provider didn't have its own schema. You just got an XML and you could do whatever you wanted. So we thought that it was a really good idea to move from MySQL to MongoDB because, you know, web scale. Uh, but the thing is, we are an analytic analytical company, so we, do all, we want to do a lot of queries and uh, aggregations and everything else. And that kind of proved difficult to do in MongoDB, especially in those days. Mm -hmm. um, MongoDB even had um, collection level locking. So one, when you do updates, you couldn't read, which was an issue because we had a lot of updates because there are a lot of games happening at the same time. Um, so that, were, that, that was a problem. Um, and also we couldn't actually aggregate um, any data uh, with simplicity. You had to write map reduce and it was really, really a pain in the ass. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when we uh, kind of figured out that we made a mistake, uh, that it was not a good move for us. And at that point, we also did something which now, I'm not, I'm not sure if I would do it now with such ease, we decided that uh, we are going to switch back from NoSQL to a relational database, uh, which is, you know, a big undertaking. Uh, you have to normalize all of the data. You have to solve conflicts. There's a lot of things that goes into that. Um, but we were young and crazy and said, you know, like, we're going to do it. This is something that we need to do. Um, and we did it. We moved to Postgres. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's something we are using to this day. Mm -hmm. In terms of the migration that you had to make, so it sounds like you basically had to move from a SQL uh, style database to Mongo and then move back from Mongo to a SQL uh, Postgres in this case. Were you, how did you do, I'm assuming you were able to do that with, a, with basically zero downtime or very little downtime. Yeah. So what were some of the challenges you, you ran into with doing that sort of large scale migration 
and how did you kind of overcome those? Yeah, so we had to do it with zero downtime because the app is global um, and there's always something going on and we cannot just uh, allow ourselves to be down. A um, couple of minutes of downtime is okay, but at that point in time, we were big enough that it was a uh, really important requirement. So the way we did it is we um, timestamped all of the collections in MongoDB. Every entity had a timestamp on when it was changed. And then we uh, created a schema in Postgres, which was a normalized version of that. And we wrote a tool that would migrate from MongoDB to Postgres and record the timestamp. And then uh, it would do its thing and that would take some time. And in the meantime, um, new stuff got updated. So then we just took from the last time the script was ran, uh, just migrate those stuff. And then the time window got short, shorter and shorter. And that's how we got it running and it, the databases were in sync. Mm -hmm. um, and to make sure that everything is working, we uh, ran a canary deployment to see that it can actually uh, handle reads. Uh, it was a read-only canary machine. And then when, once we were satisfied that everything is working as it should, we just uh, did a failover on the uh, Postgres version and surprisingly everything worked. Um, and then we, we just got rid of everything that was in MongoDB and continued our development on the uh, Postgres. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of these traffic spikes that you're having, are those primarily reads or writes? I mean, if you're doing real time uh, ingestion essentially of like sports data, I'm assuming there's a fair amount of writes that are happening, but there's also a large amount of reads. So is it, what, what is the biggest challenge in terms of managing the, the, both the ingestion of data as well as essentially the request from the data? Yeah, so that's true. So uh, when we have spikes, those spikes occur either due to a really popular small number of games for example, when uh, popular teams play or when there's a lot of smaller games happening. And in the second case, when there's a lot of smaller games happening, then we have a lot of uh, changes. So uh, just to give you a, an example, we have, uh, we have invalidation system in place, which purges the cache on, on changes that are important to us. And there it's like, we handle up to 150,000 purges per minute. So that's the amount of changes that can happen in uh, one single minute. But that's actually not the issue. That's something we can control. So if there's a lot of uh, things happening, everything gets queued. And then when we just uh, 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 go through the queue um, at our own pace. So if it was to happen that a lot of data providers would ship a lot of changes uh, at the same time. We would just queue those. The biggest issue is users. So mostly they do reads, but for some reason, when they get a push notification, they add more games. We don't know why they do that, but like at the biggest spike we have, they just keep clicking on the app and they um, sign up for more subscriptions. And that's something that's not cacheable. That's, that's the rights. And you can queue that, but we also want to give the feedback to the user that they actually did the thing that they wanted to do. So we try not to queue those things, those rights, and that's where the biggest spikes um, actually happen. Right, yeah. So essentially someone is adding more games. The yeah, user yeah. experience should be, one, I get feedback that like I'm now following this game, but I also should be able to see the live updates. Like that's my expectation. Exactly. So you yeah, can't so queue it for five minutes and then, right, <laughs> and then like check right. back in, in 10 minutes and, and your data is there. Yeah, I mean, because some people like, also mute their games. So the expectation from the user is if I mute this game now, I will get zero push notifications from now on. So that's something we cannot um, queue. And also we have a sync mechanism between devices. So what they expect is if I click the game here, I want it to show up on my other screen as well um, instantaneously. That's, that's the expectation they've come to have from us. So that's also one of the reasons why we want to do it as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. And then you mentioned the that you have a heavy reliance on you know caching in the cache layer, and that's what's helped you you know essentially have the the level of uh, like scale and responsiveness. What are some of the things 
that you've had to do in terms of developing that caching layer in order to serve the customers? Because I'm assuming the cache is probably distributed across multiple machines. How are you sort of keeping that those objects in sync across those different machines? And what other challenges have you uh, you know faced and in innovations that you've had to essentially come up with to solve different problems? That's a, that's a really interesting uh, question. I really love talking about it because that's the core of our system and what enables us to do the things we do without actually spending millions of, on infrastructure. Um, the thing is, we realized really early on that the app itself is read heavy um, and we've started to optimize our REST API to kind of be as cacheable as possible. So no endpoints will have different data types or there will not be a bl big blobs of data. They, they will be specific for things that change. So uh, things that change at different points in time will have different endpoints so that they will be more cacheable. Um, and the way that we did the whole caching system, um, so it started simple enough where we only had one varnish server. Varnish is what we use for our caching layer. It's an amazing piece of software, which is free. Um, and it can handle an absurd amount of uh, requests per second. So we only had one Monish machine uh, for every AWS instance, which um, you have a problem with scaling. So if you have one machine, then all of the cache is on one machine. When you scale your backend, we, we had backend and Monish on the same machine. When you scale it, you basically split your cache into two. So instead of just one request going to the database, you now have two. And if you um, kind of extrapolate that, if you have in your auto scaling group, if you, have, if you have 20 machines that your your cache is 20 times worse than mm -hmm. if you only had one. So the first thing we did we, is we um, separated the caching layer to be uh, in its own auto scaling group, which helped. But then like my disease kicked in and Warnish has request coalescing, which means only one request will go to the backend, everything else will get queued up on the client side, which is amazing. But if you have three machines, then three requests, which are the same, will go um, to the backend. And that's when we started looking into how can we do this to be more optimal. So basically what we have now is we have two layers of varnishes. So the first layer is there to have um, data locality and to have a really good CPU and a lot of bandwidth, which which actually uh, utilizes the CPU and the bandwidth to serve the data to devices. And then to keep all of the data in sync, um, what we do is we shard based on the hash of the URL. So all of the varnishes in the first layer, when they receive a request, if it's not in their cache, they will go to the second uh, layer of varnishes and all of them will go to one single machine. If that machine fails, um, it has a consistent hashing ring, which they will all fail over to a different varnish. Um, and it will do so in a way that it's actually distributed between all of the remaining varnishes equally. It works really well. Um, but in order to have that, um, you have to have uh, cache invalidation. And that's a really difficult thing to do. So there's this, really cool saying the two most difficult things in computer science are uh, naming things, cache and validation and off by one errors, right? <laughs> so cache and validation is really difficult. So we invested a lot of time to develop an in-house library, which basically builds out a graph of um, dependencies between entities and uh, endpoints that rely on those entities. And then once, an entity is changed, uh, we know exactly what endpoints need to be purged and what um, parameters need to be put in the endpoints. Um, and it's actually open source uh, and it works really well, enables us to have, so our current cache hit rate is more than 99%. So that means that we only need to pay for 1% of the servers. Uh, now, we would have to pay a hundred times more if we didn't have this caching layer. Mm -hmm. And also those machines are actually distributed all around the world. So the first layer is we have machines in the US, we have them in, in Brazil, we have them in India, in Sydney, uh, all around the world. Yeah, so essentially you could reduce essentially the, the 
the uh, wait and see on hop. Wait and see to the end. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's a really big difference. So it's also what enables enables us to have a kind of a system that's not as complex. So we don't have to do multi-data center on different continents. We just have the caching layer distributed. Everything else is in two data centers in France. Mm -hmm. So the inter-data center latency is really low. Um, that's where we store all of our, all of our data. And then the way we uh, kind of manage to get the latency down is by having the caching layer, which is distributed. And it makes a really big difference. So we managed to reduce the latency for, for example, for Australia from half a second to less than 80 milliseconds. So from going from something you can see, you can see the loader yeah. to something which is basically imperceivable. And that really is something that gives you an edge um, in regards to your competition because not everybody will optimize for this. So users will see that your app is fast and they will see a loader in your competition. And that's what will drive them to recommend your app to their friends and to kind of uh, gain more users. Yeah, especially in the world where someone's using this potentially as a second screen. So they're actually watching like the live sports. And then if oh, yeah. there's like a noticeable delay on the stats that's different from what they just watched on you know television, that's going to be like just a bad user experience. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it goes it goes even further. That's a funny story. So the the way uh, those streaming sites work, they get re-encoded a couple of times. So if you're watching in your TV or even worse on IPTV, uh, the app will actually be faster than what you can see on the TV because of this. So people will first see the results in the app and then they will see it on their screen. Mm -hmm. We actually had uh, users who wanted a feature request uh, to kind of slow down the push notifications and the data refresh for the games that they are watching because it's ruining their Yeah, their I was experience. wondering, is it a spoiler? <laughs> yeah, it's a spoiler. So, I mean, when we when we watch games in the company, everybody puts their phone on mute <laughs> because you, you just don't want to know. Yeah. It's yeah. that fast. Yeah, I can remember watching um, uh, it, it related to that like, like Olympics in an apartment building years ago where uh, I'm Canadian. So we were watching the, the Winter Olympics with Canada playing. And depending on where people were watching it, the feed had different delays. So you'd hear cheers from an apartment from somewhere else and be like, yeah. oh, oh like <laughs> Canada scored. <laughs> Something and I haven't yeah. watched it yet. Yeah. Yeah, so that, I can see how that would be a frustrating or uh, problem, but that, that's a, I guess like a, that's a high quality problem. If someone's like, your service is too fast, we need you to slow it down because you're ruining. Yeah, yeah, the, you're, you're faster yeah. than the television essentially. Um, so you mentioned so you know taking through this journey, like do you a big part of this has been sort of you know splitting uh, initially like splitting data from compute. So like let's not have things running on the same server. And that way you can auto scale or handle the scaling of those different services, depending on like the, the request volume that's dependent on that service. And then you do the same thing with caching. At what point did you have to start thinking, I'm assuming that this started as like a monolith application. And at some point you probably started to break up that monolith as well, because certain parts of the application, like the API layer is probably going to have a different like, scaling needs than some other part of the application. So can you talk a little bit about like when that started becoming a problem and how did you, what was the strategy for sort of starting to break that up? Yeah. So it, it, we actually did that before it started to be a problem. It kind of came naturally. Uh, so we don't have microservices. I don't like them. Um, I think people, try to use microservices too early in their development, which then causes them to have different issues. What we have are services, um, in, for the lack of a better word. So what we started doing is everything that was, sl everything that was potentially slow, uh, we uh, started putting into, into queues. Um, and that kind of grew. Um, and the first thing we did was the data ingestion. So when our data provider sends us um, data, we put it in a queue and then we have workers which par which then uh, take jobs from the queue, parse them, uh, mark them as done, and then move on to next. Then that enables you to have multiple workers if you need to do that. Um, once we moved to the cloud, we started running those job queues, uh, those workers on different uh, nodes, and that enabled us to scale that part 
independently of the API. Um, and then as time uh, passed by, we had more and more services. And now we have more than 150 different services which are running as separate um, containers in Kubernetes and they have different uh, number of replicas and they can auto scale uh, independently from each other. But the API layer itself is basically just another service. Um, and since a lot of the work that's being done is not related to the API itself, but rather to parsing the data and calculating different stuff, um, it, it just works um, and it's simple to maintain. It's a, it's, everything is in one single uh, repository. I mean, not every, most of the stuff is in one repository, which enables us to have a really um, simple development. Uh, I mean, it's simple now, but while we were growing, um, one of the issues that presented itself was we had a front-end team and a back-end team, and they worked on the same code because the front-end was actually just rendered from the back-end. And that got really annoying because you would have a lot of, uh, a lot of developers who were actively trying to modify basically the same code and the deployments got complicated. And then that's when we said the front end should be just another platform as iOS and Android apps are. So that's one of the biggest things that, that really allowed us, allowed us to have teams which can work independently. Um, and also one of the things we had was uh, we had two APIs for some reason, the web had its own API and the mobile apps had its own API, which means you have uh, twice, you have a worse uh, cache hit rate because you have different stuff that you need to hash. Um, so that's also one of the things that we did. We unified the API and really taught um, how to enable the API to grow with time without worrying so much about uh, backwards compatibility. Uh, and that has served us really well mm -hmm. in, in the last couple of years. Right. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think another motivation for, you know, starting to break up like a, a monolith or any particular application isn't just necessarily around the scaling concerns of your traffic, but also around the like internal scaling concerns of like your engineering team. Because if everybody's basically working against the same uh, project, and then it starts to be, they start to like uh, uh, become a organizational problem or a deployment problem because essentially everybody's kind of just like running over each other to some degree. Yeah, exactly. So you have a lot of people working on the same code base, you get a lot of conflicts and then you have to resolve those conflicts and then you just get slower. Um, I remember in the early days we would do, we would do a lot of deployment and then once a month we would release a new version and then all hell would break loose. And then we said, okay, we should probably kind of deploy more often. And then we moved from one month to two weeks and then from two weeks to one week and from one week to every two days. And now we have like 50 deployments every day because every single thing that's changed is just immediately deployed. Um, and then you can see if it's working or not. And, it, and if something breaks, you can easily roll back and you can see what change actually made the, the, the problem, the bug. Mm -hmm. And it's really easy to do deployment in that way. When we get new developers in the company, um, junior developers usually deploy within the first two days. It's, it's so simple mm -hmm. to use. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the so you mentioned queuing earlier and how important that is to you know some of the things that you're doing around like data ingestion. So was the were you use when you migrated to the cloud, were you using things like SQS on um on uh AWS for queuing or was this something that you built yourself? And then what is sort of the status of your like queuing pipeline today? Are you taking advantage of you know newer technologies around like things like Kafka, for example? Yeah. So um, we actually used a library for queuing, which is called Rescue, which relies on Redis, and it's extremely fast. But the thing is, it's a client-side implementation. So if you want to switch technologies, you have to re-implement it in another language. It was actually developed by the guys from GitHub, so it's uh, really high quality. 
but then once we knew that we wanted to write some services in another language, not PHP, then we realized that we should probably move away from the client side implementation and use a queue that's really a server side queue, uh, which is which would be better suited. Uh, fortunately, we didn't use we didn't use SQS because that made our migration from the cloud to uh, our data center more easy. Uh, if we had relied on SQS, you it would be coupled to AWS, which right. is not a bad thing, right? It's I mean, usually when people say you shouldn't couple or rely on anything, that's you cannot live your life with worrying that it should be completely modular and to be able to write and uh, to be able to run it anywhere. Uh, but yeah, we've moved to a job queue, which is called Beanstalk. It's written in C. It's really fast and it works really well. Uh, we had no need for Kafka. Kafka is a bit too uh, too big in, in my opinion for our use because we need something that's simple and easy and nimble and doesn't use a lot of resources. Um, and that's what enables us to be on this scale. So everything, everything is queued, like everything that can be is queued. Uh, everything that depends on any third party services. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of, you know, you mentioned earlier that, you know, one of the reasons Mongo didn't work out is because you need to do a lot of sort of like analytical queries. Have you evolved the way that you're doing, you know, uh, some of your analytics today? Are you still relying on Postgres and running queries there? Or have you invested in new types of technologies that have been like there's new types of databases that have been developed specifically for performing analytical operations at scale uh, that are like highly performant beyond just what you might get out of with an out of the box sort of SQL uh, database. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So one of the we've moved to Postgres for two different reasons. One is the analytical part, and the other is it actually has this cool thing called MVCC, multi-version concurrency control, which basically allows you to read and write at the same time. So you can update your data and still be able to read it. Uh, and that's what's something that's really important to us because we want users to be able to read the old state of the database while we are writing the new state. Um, and that's something that Postgres does really, really well. Um, as far as the analytical part, uh, we are still using Postgres for the sports data, but for uh, analysis of user data. So every click in the app is uh, recorded automatically by Firebase SDK. Um, it's anonymized when, when sending to Firebase. And what we do is we download all of that data um, and run our machine learning models on it to figure out which users will be our long time users, uh, which are the most valuable ones to kind of optimize campaigns and also to um, different personalization stuff in the app. And that's, that's a lot of data. So we have one terabyte of data every day. And we uh, started doing that in 2019. So it's more than a petabyte of data right now. And honestly, that's just too much for Postgres. Um, it, it wouldn't scale. We have 1 billion rows every day uh, that, are, that are ingested. And the database we use for that is called ClickHouse. Mm -hmm. It's developed by Yandex and it's a, really a specifically crafted for analytical workloads. It's a column oriented uh, data store and it's really efficient in, in storing and querying the data. Mm -hmm. But for the sports data, we're still using Postgres because that data is not as big. So it's only 150 gigabytes of data. Uh, it's it's not an issue for, for, for Postgres. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so you a little while ago, you were talking about how your deployment model has changed over time from, you know, you're going, I, I think like you started deploying, it was like, you know, several months or something like that. And now you, and basically you evolve to a continuous deployment model. What is that CICD pipeline like today? Like what tools are you using to essentially handle your uh, deployment? Yeah, it's actually more than CICD. It's, it's kind of our own in-house solution, which is quite, um, 
it allows us to do a lot of stuff, but it isn't really that complicated. Um, so basically what we can do is we can deploy any branch for any project we have to production really easily. Uh, basically what happens is uh, any person in the team can say, I want to deploy my branch. Um, and the system will basically take all of the branches that are in auto deploy. It will merge them uh, sequentially. It will then build out a um, container image and it will deploy it in, in production. And that really enables us to kind of test things out in production without actually having to commit anything to master. And then once something is commit to the master branch on GitHub, it will just get auto deployed again. And what enables us to have this sort of um, belief in, in, in the system that it will work is we have a lot of tests which are run automatically. So the way we do development is we just, um, when we are working on a feature or, or a bug fix, a um, new branch will get created. That branch cannot be merged to master without passing certain checks. Those checks are tests. You have to, um, the linter has to pass. You have to get approved from QA. You have to get approved from your peers and then it, it can be merged. Mm -hmm. And it's really, a, I mean, it's a custom solution, but it's, um, I'm not going to say a couple of lines of code, but definitely just a couple of files with certain logic within it. It's not a complicated system. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, but I think it's really, sorry, I, it's really important. I think for companies that want to grow and kind of be fast, you have to do uh, deployment daily. Uh, if you can, of course, I mean, if yeah. you're, if you're, if you have to, um, create an, an uh, a binary version and ship it to your commerce customers that will then, uh, have to deploy it on their infra, then obviously you cannot do it every hour, but if you can, it really allows you to grow your product more, more rapidly. Yeah. I mean, you just run into a lot of like organizational challenges with, you know, people developing for long periods of time independently and then, you know, doing a merge and then doing a deployment and everybody sort of crossing their fingers, and <laughs> hoping that yeah, things yeah, work. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, and now that I think about it, like our deployment before is we would just FTP to the server and drag files. <laughs> and then when we started, um, when we moved to the cloud, then you would just have the Amazon machine image, which was amazing. And then we would have the same code on all of the machines always. And once we decided that the cloud is too expensive and moved back to the data center, we wanted something like it because we didn't want to FTP to every single machine to do it. So that's when we started using um, uh, containers because you could just build once and then run on all of the machines, you could have the same code. And that's something that I think is really important because if you're uploading manually, um, then you have different states on different machines and it's just a nightmare to debug. Mm -hmm. And then yeah, you also, the, the thing is um, you should have cattle, not pets. Um, you shouldn't treat your servers as special little snowflakes. You should just <laughs> create and destroy them. Uh, that makes your life easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you mentioned uh, uh, you doing canary deployments earlier. Is that part of your your regular deployment model? Are you always doing a, sort of a progressive rollout? So that's something we didn't do before. And then for certain features, we started doing canary deployments. But right now we don't actually have the need for that because the rollback is so easy where we can just deploy something in production. And if something breaks, you can roll back within a uh, couple of seconds. So we do have the support for it. It's just not needed uh, anymore. I mean, in Kubernetes, it's really easy to do. Uh, you just have a service which points to two different deployments, mm -hmm. uh, but we don't have the need for it anymore. We just deploy it to production because the changes are small and, and incremental. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you were an early adopter to you know AWS. And then at some point you started to move back to like running your own infrastructure. So are you running a hybrid mm -hmm. setup today? Yeah. So the the main reason what why we've moved from the cloud is just because of the price i mean i love the cloud uh, and i was sorry to kind of move away from it but we got to a point where our traffic was costing us more than compute 
which was ridiculous. So that's when we started to look for alternatives. And that's when we moved our caching layer away from AWS and onto on-prem. And once we saw that this is working really well um, and that we can actually over-provision the system by a double uh, to have more than double the capacity of our highest peak and still for it to cost less than the auto-scaling cloud, we said, okay, we have to move to on-prem. It's not actually our data center. We just lease the servers right. month by month. Uh, but the thing, the issue you have there is what if you've uh, miscalculated uh, the capacity you need? So what happens if you have more users than you have capacity? So that's why we've actually built a system, which is also really simple, which allows us to spin up virtual machines so all of our machines are dedicated machines, which we pay month by month. But if the load is high enough, it will trigger um, an API call to our provider, which will spin up new machines. Those machines will uh, automatically join Kubernetes cluster and they will um, kind of get part of the load and then everything will work. If the load goes up again, then new machines will be spun up. And that's uh, how we have the hybrid cloud approach where we, Kind of have the low price, but also the scalability of the cloud if mm -hmm. we need. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really like innovative solution. You're you're kind of investing in uh, like existing servers to serve your sort of baseline use case, and then leveraging cloud to to scale when you have these like spikes that maybe go beyond what the sort of baseline capacity is. Yeah, exactly. I mean. The, um, when we first uh, started using the cloud, uh, the thing is we had really big spikes, but once we figured out how to do the cache uh, layer uh, efficiently, then all of the spikes kind of got read from the cache. So there wasn't a really big spike on the backend itself, but the, the spike was on the caching layer, which doesn't need to scale as much because it can handle a lot. So the the bottleneck is not the cpu it's actually the bandwidth and you have if you have really good machines with a lot of bandwidth then you don't really have the need to scale them unless you of course uh, need to put out more bandwidth than you have and that's when we got into the situation where we don't actually need to scale as much so the auto scaling groups would basically remain the same most of the time mm -hmm. um, and then that's what uh, allowed us to um, say okay, we are uh, we are going to move away, and we know that it will work because we don't actually need the auto scan group as much as we did before. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you started your journey as so a basically the engineering team was you know, two college kids, you yourself, and, and one yeah. other person, and then you know, I'm, I'm sure it's it's grown significantly over the last, you know, 13 years and you've evolved a lot as, you know, an engineer yourself now into the role of CTO, but how has the engineering or company culture changed and evolved during that time as you become, you know, a bigger organization? Yeah, it's changed a lot. I mean, I have a, a really funny anecdote. So once we, we only had the web application uh, in the beginning, and then we started to invest into mobile apps. While at that point in time, like push notifications were basically non-existent. We were the first live score application which um, implemented push notifications. That's how early we started. But the thing is, the way we did development in those early days, we had a guy who would um, code up a new version and then he was too lazy to kind of send the APK file to all of the team members to test it out. He would just uh, upload to production and say, this is in production, please test the app. <laughs> that's, that's how development was done in the early days. But once you get to a certain point in time, once you get to a certain point of users, you realize you cannot do that stuff anymore. So right now, I don't want to have the corporate world where everything needs to get signed off on. Uh, but we do have a process which kind of gives the developers the confidence to to develop with ease. So all of the code is, I mean, I already said this, it's, it's developed in a separate branch. It has to pass all of these checks and then it gets deployed. If an issue arises, then it's rolled back easily. Um, 
So we kind of want to empower developers to be able to move fast and not break things. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, the company is larger now. It's no longer a, a startup. So you have a lot of colleagues that can help you with your issues. When we started, like I couldn't ask anybody to help me. Um, all of the problems that arose, especially when something went down um, in production, I would have to fix it basically because I was the most senior guy in, in the company. And that was really stressful because, you know, you couldn't get on vacation if something broke. I would have to get online and fix it. Now everything is split among multiple people. So more people know uh, different parts of the system. So not there is no system that depends on just one person. I, I think that's really, really important. Uh, you cannot have uh, a company where only one person knows one part of the system. And if that person leaves, you have an issue. Yeah, absolutely. You can't have a bus factor one. On yeah, your, on exactly. Systems, right? Exactly. So what's next for you and for SofaScore? Uh, we have a lot of things. So we have more ideas than we have people who can implement those ideas, which has always been uh, a problem for us. There's uh, so much we want to do. Uh, the things that we are most focused on in the, in the coming weeks and months and years is we want to empower uh, lower league sports to have visibility in the world. So you have a lot of leagues that are still um, running their league uh, by writing into Excel files or on paper. Uh, so we have a software called SofaScore Editor, which allows you to input, to basically digitalize your league and to have visibility of your league in the world. So anybody in the world can see what your league is doing, how the players are performing and we also love this because we can enable uh, a lot of people to get access to a lot of data. So we want to invest more in crowdsourcing and, and in this lower leagues editor as well. Uh, we see something like this that will uh, help us grow as a company and also to give back to the world. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's great. And so I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. I thought this was uh, really, really fascinating. I love these deep dives of through like the history of a company. I think, like I was saying at the top of the show, this is the way I learn, and I think of the way a lot of people learn, like from people who've actually you know done these types of things. And I love the practicality of what you're doing as well, and how you solve these different problems. Like you're taking a real first principles approach rather than just falling in love with something. Like we're not just going to adopt Kafka because it's a newfangled, like hot technology. We're going to look at this problem and what makes sense for the shape of the problem within our company. Should we use something like that or should we use something else? Should we build something, buy something, use an open source project and so forth, or even, you know, adopt microservices because that's the the cool thing that we're hearing about on you know, Stack Overflow or, or Reddit or something like that. Uh, and I think that yeah. is a, uh, that strategy is, is one that served you well, and I think it would serve others well. Yeah, I mean, um, we there, there's always this discussion between if you're going to build it yourself or use something that's already existing in the world or pay somebody else to do it. And it's kind of a thing that you have to decide for yourself. Uh, we have stuff that we built ourselves because we couldn't find the alternative that was good enough. But usually most of the stuff is just, we take existing technology and find a way to kind of fit it so it works well together with other parts of the system. And who knows, maybe in a couple of years, I'm going to say that we are now too big and we have to move to microservices because that's something that works well for, for teams that are larger than, than we are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, again, I want to thank you so much. And uh, hopefully we meet in person uh, next year in Croatia. And cheers. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. This was really an interesting <laughs> talk and hopefully we will meet in person.